All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, hope you had a good one. Uh, we'll uh, we'll resume with where we left off. Okay. The last point that we looked at was uh, of what happens in worship. Okay, let's just take a look at the three points that we uh, we learned in the last session. Okay, what happens when we worship God? Worship transforms and changes us. We become like the one we worship. Amen. Uh, if that doesn't motivate us to become more like Jesus, then I don't know what will. Right? And in worship, we experience God's presence. And finally, worship empowers us to rule and reign. Amen. Uh, do you all have any questions? Sorry, I did not ask. I did not have time to ask you all for questions. Uh, were, you, were you all able to follow um, the last section of everything that we learned? Any thoughts or, or any questions? Okay, I guess not. Okay. Uh, all right, then let's just continue now. Okay, uh, we are in page 23 of chapter 5, page 23 of this chapter 5. And this section is called Worshipping God in Difficult Times. Worshipping God in Difficult Times. Uh, we've already touched a couple of these examples in the previous chapters when we studied about praise. Um, but let's just look at uh, one or two examples from this. Okay. Worshipping God in difficult times. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Right? I will bless the Lord at all times. And uh, there are certain uh, translations that says, or, or different languages that say, I will bless the Lord in all seasons. Right? Without giving a break, will I bless him? Will I praise him? Amen. Um, there's a couple of examples that's uh, mentioned in the notes uh, of worshiping God in difficult times, of people who worship God in difficult times. Uh, the first one there is uh, the father of faith himself, right? That's Abraham. Uh, we go to Genesis chapter 22, right? Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Okay, um, I'll just read a few scriptures for us. Um, I'll read from verse 1, Genesis chapter 22. Uh, please follow along with me. It says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Okay, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Right. Um, I don't want to go through the entire chapter and I'm assuming that we all know what what actually went went on right uh why is it worshiping him in difficult times and uh why is abraham as given as an example um wh wh why what would your reason be guys like why is abraham's uh life used as an example of who, why he worshiped during difficult times what do you think I think his personal walk with God was more strong 
so that he even in difficult times he was able to trust god completely right okay yeah thanks john yep okay what is he was uh, i think he was offering his own son uh like um as an act of obedience so that that is an act of worship towards god um yeah okay thank you divya right yep okay and what is uh what else can you tell about his journey anybody actually you know i'm just asking a question so this isaac uh, he received from god like nearly waiting for 25 years and mm -hmm. now god was asking him to sacrifice right yeah. yeah thank you thank you rosalind yes yeah that's another valid point isn't it uh absolute dependence on god yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay so you see it's uh abraham is about uh 75 years old when god calls him out it's in genesis chapter 12 right uh and then at this point in genesis 21 that is the chapter that talks about the birth of isaac right so the the age, the the timeline gap is approximately 25 years that's what the historians claim history claims right it's about 25 years so abraham was 100 sarah was 90 uh right now um let me just share um screen of just to give us an idea of abraham's journey okay right i hope we all can see the screen right uh, this is just to give an idea of abraham's journey so this is the place of origin abraham's place of origin okay ur or you are or okay uh this is the place god calls him out of uh, it is and it's mentioned in genesis 12 onwards right when god just starts a new race all by himself through this man abraham he makes a covenant with him right and although he doesn't directly say in the first four first four verses that he is going to have a son and a lineage and a descendants and what not there is an there is an implication there is a hint okay but this whole journey and and like we just saw that you know he waited for 25 years right now a lot can happen in 25 years isn't it i mean a lot has happened in a year and a half <laughs> uh and just think about the things that that can happen in 25 years two decades and a half okay two decades and a half okay look his journey he's, he travels you know just through this red line here goes to this place and you know comes back to this place and he comes to this place called Shechem and Bethel and this place called Moriah that we just read in the bible uh, in Genesis 22 goes down south to Hebron Beersheba and Kadesh and then he and there's a season where he goes to Egypt because of uh, famine and then when he comes back he came he comes back rich that's one headache and then the other headache was that he came back with Hagar okay from egypt <laughs> um so all of this right is happening in 25 years um okay i'll stop the screen sharing there just for a second okay so just when you just think through his uh his life in 25 years of of just waiting for the promise to come through it, it was definitely not easy right and just keeping aside everything that you know that happened in his life that through that process um but one of the things that he abraham does is he was also known as the man of altars and like i've mentioned before you know we study on the life of abraham in the, in in the final year worship ministry as man of altars that he was man of worship where he continually reminded himself he built an altar he worshiped he sur he surrendered uh, before the lord and what right uh, and that was just a and this beautiful act of faith um it, that the bible records so worshiping him in 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 difficult times and to go through something and waiting on him 
waiting on God for 25 years. Um, it's easy for us to just read about it because we have the Bible now. And so, yeah, okay, Abraham waited for 25 years, you know, and yeah, he, I, you know, he went through this uh, and whatnot. But waiting on the promise for 25 years and finally receiving it, and then God asking him to, uh, you know, God testing him to, uh, you know, sacrifice his son, his only son. It's amazing. Right? Your only son whom you love. Uh, it's just John 3.16 written all over it, isn't it? Um, and Abraham obeyed. And Abraham was willing to go the distance until God steps in. Right? Uh, so that's his life kind of reflects Psalm chapter 34 verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times in every season I will bless him. All right? Uh, I want us to go to uh, Psalm 137. Psalm 137. It's not in the notes but just uh, bear with me. Psalm 137. Okay. Are you all there? Yeah. Psalm 137. Okay. Here it starts off by saying, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Another translation might have, when we remembered Jerusalem. There on the poplars, it's a tree, okay? On the poplar trees, we hung our harps. For there, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Okay. Talk about difficult times. This is one of the most hideous and the most terrible things in the history of Israel. Okay. Uh, Babylon, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was the ruler back then. And they had already invaded Judah and Israel, Jerusalem in particular, uh, where the tribe of Judah uh, dwelt. It's the southern part of it, right? They were there for, <clears throat> they've been there for a while. They've been, uh, you know, troubling the king uh, to pay taxes. Okay, and they obliged for a certain time. And then the king says, I don't want to pay taxes anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, um, have you ever been in a position where the enemy just pushes you and pushes you and pushes you? And you're like, you know what? I can't do this anymore. Doesn't matter what I'm going through. I, 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 I just can't do this anymore. Right. Um, it was to that extreme, the kingdom of Babylon pushed the people, the, the Jewish people, the people of Jerusalem. To that extent, they said, you know what? We're not going to pay taxes anymore. Do what you want to do. And King Nebuchadnezzar gets angry and they, he destroys the temple and they take the people of Judah, the Jews, into, into captivity, the people of praise into captivity. Okay, um, Babylon was, it was a superpower of, of back then. Okay, just ag again, you know, I keep saying to put yourself in their shoes, but imagine just being uh, chased out of your own country. We, when we look at the situation in Afghanistan and people just wanting to flee their country because of the terror that they are that they are being put through and that they are facing or they are scared of, uh, we are very thankful to be in our own country, uh, you know. But most of them are not. Uh, but that's, that's exactly what's happening here. Because of the superpower, Babylon was what Rome was going to be, right? It was a superpower. They have taken the people out of their land. And it is at the rivers of Babylon. Uh, they said, 
they hung their instruments on the tree, their harps on the tree. They said they wept and wept and wept when they remembered Zion, a place, their place of worship. And it did not end there. Their tormentors, you know, it's almost like they were making fun of them. Like, you know, like, hey, you know, just imagine, he's like, hey, come on, go on and sing. Sing your song of praise. Just go on. Go on, sing one of your songs of Zion. Sing one of those songs that you sing to your God. Sorry. Go on, one, go on and sing. Go on and, uh, and worship. You know, in a very... Uh, in a very teasing way. And, and look at their response in verse 4. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land, while in a strange land, the other translation says. How can we sing? How can we sing the song of the Lord during these troubled times? How can we sing and praise him during this season that I don't see any breakthrough? I'm waiting on him. I don't know what to do. Uh, nothing seems to be coming, going right. Uh, you know, I'm depressed. Uh, I'm going through depression and anxiety. I don't know what uh, tomorrow holds for me. I don't know where uh, my tomorrow's provisions are going to come from. How can I sing his praise? When I'm going through this. So that's what we do, isn't it? Sometimes or most of the times is we associate our praise and our worship to a place or to a season. That's what they're doing. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? It was, it was a weird time. It was a different. It was a difficult time. It was a difficult season, strange season. They are not in their own land. And and we do that many times, isn't it? Um, is we associate worship? I will worship only if this person is leading worship. I will only worship in in the church. I will only worship when I'm going, when I'm happy, and when I'm full of joy, when everything is going right. When you know, when I have the job I want, I will worship. When I have, etc., 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 isn't it? That's exactly what the enemy also wants us to do is he wants to silence us. And he want, he kind of mocks us. It's like, you know, ah, during, this, during this difficult time, can you sing? But an encouragement here for us is that we can learn from this passage is that uh, like we see in Psalm 34, uh, I will bless the Lord at all times in every season in every uh, phase of my life, be it the low or the highs, there is an invitation to praise, right? Because this is, guys, this is really a dark moment. Uh, it's one of the second dark moments uh, in the history of Israel. The first time, if you remember, is in First Samuel chapter 4, when the Ark of the Covenant gets captured. Right? The Ark of the Covenant gets captured by the Philistines. Okay, so there it was the Ark of the Covenant, and here it is the people of the Covenant that's taken into captivity. Um, you know that that's stopping them from praising. But uh, yeah, that's one. That's another example, an encouragement that you you and I can take. Uh, you know, is it doesn't matter which season that we are in, which times uh, we we go through. Our worship cannot be limited, cannot be associated to a place like Zion, to to uh, to a season, to a good season that we go through. Uh, but I pray that we will be encouraged, uh, you know, to not stop from singing. Amen. Uh, you know, this is not to say that the difficult times... Uh, you know, changes, it suddenly overnight becomes and whatnot. It can, you never know. God is a God of impossibilities, right? What worship does during these difficult times is it makes the time possible, right? It, it, it just makes it, it just makes it possible for you to go through. It gives you a strength for that day, for that moment, for you, for you to endure, Okay, that phase of life. Okay, and we see that in in the life of David, as given in as mentioned in the notes, and Paul and Silas, right? 
we, we, we've seen that example uh, in the power of praise in the previous chapters. Right, guys? So uh, just some of the summary points there in the notes, yeah, page 23 is, our worship of God is not based on our emotions, feelings, right? Being in a happy mood and whatnot. Uh, worship is a choice that we make. And, and that becomes a sacrifice because worship involves a sacrifice. When we choose to worship God in difficult circumstances, we elevate the truth about our circumstance. Right? When we choose, when we make that choice to worship God in difficult circumstances, we elevate the truth about our circumstance. When we worship God, we invite his rule and reign that changes the very atmosphere of our difficult circumstances. Okay. Um, guys, um, I just don't want this to be like a theory class, okay, where I give you these points and, you know, it's like, okay, you understand it in your head. I say, yeah, okay, you know, we worship, it's worship is a choice, it involves sacrifice, you know, logically it makes sense, uh, I would hope. But I just, do, I, I don't want it to remain there, right? I mean, as it is with every other class and whatnot, but more so with praise and worship, because I think there is a tendency, because of the popularity of the subject, uh, for us to become over familiar of the power of praise and worship. Right. So to all the 20 people uh, in the class, just let it not be theory. Just let it not be some bullet points that you have uh, just a knowledge. Uh, OK, you know, so and so, so and so when we worship him. Yeah, he invites us to rule and reign. No, uh, let it sink in. OK. All right. So uh, that is worshiping him in difficult times. Um, and two scriptures as mentioned at the bottom of page 23 is uh, just a reminder for us that we need to worship God only because idolatry is spiritual adultery. Okay. Idolatry in the natural, right? Adultery in the natural is what idolatry in the spiritual is. Okay. Um, so just a few key takeaways in the next page. Uh, is worship is the recognition of who God is. Worship is reverence for God. It's communion with God and our response to an encounter with him. And the father is seeking true worshipers. Worship changes us. And we can worship God in difficult circumstances. And it is the Holy Spirit in us that abides in us who will empower us to worship him in difficult times. Amen. Are you guys with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. I'm just looking at the chat. Great. Thank you, Divya. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Priya. Okay. Um, let's go to the next section now. Uh, the hindering attitudes in worship. Hindering attitudes in worship. All right. Um, the first point mentioned there is pride. The greatest hindrance in worship. Mm. <laughs> the greatest hindrance in worship is the attitude of being um, proud or pride. The essence of worship is our humility. Sometimes we are more concerned about the opinions of others than we are about the Lord's opinion. Never do anything because others are looking at you uh, and never refrain from anything because others are looking at you. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's a few scriptures that I want us to uh, dwell into and just see. Uh, okay, pride, it's, it's mentioned there is the greatest hindrance in worship. Like, can we go to Isaiah chapter 14, please? Isaiah chapter 14. I'm sure we've read this many times, but let's go there. Okay, Isaiah chapter 14. 
I will read from verse 12 to 15, okay? Isaiah 14, 12 onwards. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Verse 15. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. One of the first worship leaders had serious issues with the humility and submission. Isn't it? Uh, he said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will make myself like the most high. Uh, let's go to Ezekiel quickly. Um, also, on the way, let's just keep a finger on in Daniel. But uh, yeah, we'll we go to Ezekiel first. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14 onwards, okay? Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14 onwards. It says, You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the days you were created, from the day you were created. Till wickedness was found in you. Verse 17. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Okay, it's amazing how pride is always associated with the fall. Right? There was a lesson in moral science in 7th standard or something. Pride has a fall in my school days. Right? Uh, pride is always followed by a fall. And like we read that in the scriptures. Okay, um, Let's quickly go to the book of Proverbs, actually. We, we'll skip Daniel. You guys with me, right? I hope you don't mind reading these scriptures. Okay, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Uh, we'll, we'll first look at uh, Proverbs chapter 16 first, and then we'll also go to Proverbs chapter 6 later. Okay. First, we'll go to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Okay, can someone read that for us, please? Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Yeah, pride goes before destruction. That means destruction is followed by pride. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Yeah. Thank you, Lyndon. Okay. Um, and then now let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Okay, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 to 19. Can, uh, can someone read that for us, please? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 onwards to 19. There are six things which the Lord hates, a seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that runs rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Thanks, John. Okay, the six things the Lord hates. Okay. This is the Lord. Okay. And 
have you ever pay, played this game or you know have been in a circle where you say okay hey what do you like and what you don't like have you ever played this game right and then we go in a circle and uh, you know the, every individual says okay i like so and so and i i hate this i i don't like this at all right um there's some kind of an attention there right it's like and then you what you don't like this uh, and then if they use the word i hate this movie you hate this movie how can you hate it it's amazing type of things right this is just not another individual this is not a list of <laughs> the six things the lord hates seven that are an abomination to him that are detestable the first thing on the list is pride haughty eyes which is translated as pride the first thing that just absolutely disgusts god right uh i just want to read for us something from this book uh uh please bear with me cuz uh this is absolutely been uh wrecking my heart okay by the way this um this book is called humility uh, the beauty of holiness it's by andrew murray i think I, i'm not sure if i shared this but it's called humility the beauty of holiness by andrew murray it's a must read it's a very small book uh, about 80 pages or something that's it but um okay um i just want to read something for us uh just please bear with me okay and please please pay attention so pride or the loss of this humility is the root of every sin and evil it was when the now fallen angels began to look upon themselves with self complacency or self dependency that they were led to disobedience okay self complacency it's amazing that self dependence can lead to disobedience um that's what led that's what happened there and were cast down from the light of heaven into outer darkness okay even so it was when the serpent breathed the poison of his pride the desire to be as god into the hearts of our first parents that they too fell from their high estate into all the wretchedness in which man is now sunk it's amazing what he says that he breathed the serpent breathed the poison of his pride the desire to be as god because that's what he said isn't it he tells eve isn't it is like uh, you know god tells you not to eat of this fruit because he knows that if you eat you will become like him you see the lies of the devil isn't it that was his pride that was his poison uh to just to continue in heaven and earth pride self exaltation is the gate and the birth and the curse of hell okay if uh yeah i, I just kind of stop there but it's just, it's just i i can read the whole thing chapter but i don't want to do that but uh but i, I think that's uh that's that's enough warning for us about pride and its danger isn't it uh it's the origin of pride is the devil but the origin and the source of all humility is jesus right we become like the one we worship we got to be careful with whom we worship isn't it amen so that's one of the first hindering attitudes uh in worship uh pride will just absolutely wreck havoc in your life if you have a condescending attitude like i am better than you and you know i'm better than everybody else i can do better etc 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 um god resists the proud isn't it in james chapter 4 6 he resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble Amen. God gives grace to the humble uh, because he sees himself when somebody humbles. Uh, all right, let's go on. Another hindering attitude. So, 
if if the first point is in check, we don't really have to worry about the rest of the remaining points, the two, three, four, uh, because everything else is kind of birthed out of that place. But however, the second hindering attitude in worship is um, irreverence. We do not rever God's nature. We expect his blessings to be showered on us without any sacrifice, investment of prayer, or humble repentance on our part. Um, there's absolutely no regard for his presence. That's just another attitude. Again, it's birthed out of pride, isn't it? Self-dependence or self-complacency. I don't need the Lord. I don't need his goodness. Uh, you know, when I want, I want without any investment in prayer and whatnot. Uh, that's irreverence. And when we saw in the in the previous uh, earlier in this chapter is one of the things about worship is worship is reverence for God. And if that is missing, then hey, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Um, and the third point there is spectatorism. Sometimes, okay, congregations tend to watch. Guilty. Sometimes congregations tend to watch the worship team than to be participators in worship themselves. We are all commanded to worship, right? Um, we are commanded to participate. Uh, we are all commanded to shout for joy, as the Bible says. We are all commanded to lift our hands in worship. We are all commanded to bow, uh, bow down before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, isn't it? Uh, we are called to involve right um there was this one encouraging story i heard long back okay so uh there the, there is a breed I, I don't know which breed of dogs but they are used for hunting okay uh, hunting dogs they're called as hunting dogs um so when their master you know just where, wherever the hunting is legal okay not talking about illegal stuff wherever the hunting is legal when they go duck hunting or whatever when the master shoots the duck uh, or can't find the prey, is looking for the prey, he sends his two hunting dogs, like he, they normally have two hunting dogs, and they would search and search and search. And when one of the dogs finds the prey, he'll just point towards that direction of the prey and just holds its position. Okay, it points its nose in that direction or the face or the head, and it, and it holds its position like a statue. And the second dog immediately copies the first dog that actually found the prey. Okay, so it's just imitating. So, you know, it knows, it believes that this, this dog has found something that I haven't. And then the master comes and, you know, takes position and kills. So it's most of the times, you know, it's like that for us in worship, and why I would use that as an example to encourage us, as, encourage us is there will be times in worship when we come together and we gather, for whatever reason, there will be another individual who will recognize the presence of Jesus, and you might not feel anything. Feel, right? But it's okay, you know, you to trust that individual and say, like, hey, that individual, that person is recognizing something in this room that I am not. But I am going to do that anyways. I'm going to lift my hands anyways if I'm not feeling or whatnot. Right? So that is just an example to break that barrier of being a spectator. Is recognizing, okay, that individual, someone else knows that he is here. So I'm going to acknowledge that and participate in it until you find him, right? You can get it? Okay. Uh, let's move on. The fourth attitude uh, that hinders in worship is sentimentalism. When the music means more to the worshiper than the message of the song. Overly familiar songs are in danger of becoming sentimental for us. Um, okay, it's self-explanatory there, okay. When we give more, this is actually more important for musicians. It's a, it's a huge hindrance, if I should say. Okay, it's a huge dilemma, uh, even for me. You know, it's, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's to, it's to look beyond music. It's, it's to look beyond, uh, you know, 
just the songs and just to capture that heart of worship as like the song says right um, the heart of worship is what when the music fades away and everything is stripped away and i simply come before his presence uh, right uh, so that's putting aside sentimentalism uh, and paying mere lip service this is uh, in connection with uh, spectatorism okay just singing uh, you know it's not really engaging with what uh, with what is being sung and, and what not right that can happen isn't it guys <laughs> right um, a classic example is uh, what's that you have turned my morning into dancing you, you can uh, you, you, that song you know you have turned my morning into dancing it's amazing how people will just stand and sing that song <laughs> it's and not turn or not dance okay yes yes i know it says you <laughs> you're singing but it's just doing uh, not doing what the song is asking you to do uh just paying mere lip service and what not <clears throat> fear of manipulation fear of being controlled by the worship leader i don't want to do what he tells me to do i will do what i want to do uh, <laughs> all right and then finally resisting change we have never done it this way before that's the quote you know uh, we will do what we have done for hundreds of years and i don't like change sometimes there is the fear of change um and our god is creative god right and can work in so many different ways right um in every generation every time god has moved there's been a release of a different sound right every decade every every generation has seen a different sound being open to the change and resisting change will always uh you know there will always be an exchange of unpleasantries there will always cause friction between generations and between the leaders in the church and what not but uh, just being open for change uh, you know being open for creativity and um, and being open uh, in creating an atmosphere and a culture of failure meaning you try this out if you fail it's okay but you're at least not resisting it it's like you know when the drums were first introduced in the church it was a devil's instrument electric guitar <laughs> right uh, but now uh, you know the times have changed isn't it so <clears throat> um let's be open uh, you know let's not put god in a box uh, let's not put worship in a box uh, and say this is how we worship this is the methods that we will follow and nothing else and what not okay so these are the seven uh, hindering attitudes in worship uh that we need to be uh, careful in in our personal lives in our own lives all right any questions guys anything you want to add i see the viewers uh, christians don't tell lies they just go to church and sing them <laughs> yeah <laughs> aw tells you christian don't tell lies they just go to church and sing them yeah 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 right okay anything anything you uh, guys would like to add or say uh i just wanted to uh, know your thoughts on this uh like there was a statement uh where it said in worship knowledge becomes experience right uh so yeah um can you elaborate more on that sure sure yeah see again um so we have all this uh you know knowledge we've learned of, you know like worship is recognizing who god is worship is reverence god worship is communion with god and worship is an a uh, response to our encounter with god and so on and so forth right uh and we have all this knowledge like saying worship changes us uh, we're in worship we experience the presence of god in worship we are empowered to rule and reign uh worship is a lifestyle and what not right so all we have all of this knowledge uh when you take all of this knowledge and as a result of humility you come before him and say uh you know 
I worship you in everything that I do. You acknowledge him. Uh, you know, you you allow God to transform you. You allow God to change you. You allow Him, uh, you know, to pour His grace over and empower you. So, and you're just putting all of this theory that you know, this knowledge, into practice. So, when when that happens, you begin to experience Him. You begin to actually see the fruit of what you know, of all the things that you know. It's where the seeds kind of start growing right you know and you keep nurturing the seed until you see the tree grow and you see the fruits you nurture them with prayer with spending time with him and, and whatnot so uh yeah i mean that's my understanding of it yeah. okay okay thank you thank you All right, class. Uh, I mean, if there's no uh, no other questions or thoughts that you'd like to share, um, we'll stop here and uh, we'll resume next week. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining in. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. And uh, yeah, put into practice the knowledge of praise and worship. All right. See you, everybody. Take care. Bye bye.